episode 58 of Strange Brown Radio. I'm your host again, Tobe Johnson, and today we are speaking to, well, I call them friends and family, experiencers of some sort or another. So we go on the record. It's a two-part series, and I'll tell you more how that will work in a moment. But thank you again to our sponsor, Feral by Aaron, E-R-Y-N, at Etsy.com. Check out all of these alchemy sound devices and tools available at Etsy.com and the good folks, where we do our podcast live, including March 7th, with guest and contributor of Ancient Aliens, man Marcia K. Moore at Manresa Castle, March 7th through uh, that's 6 to 9 p.m. And I'll tell you more about that and how you can be a part of it coming up. All right, next up, a two-part series with friends and family regarding their own personal experiences. We'll be right back. All right, today's episode is going to be a two-part series. The first is for all you folks, the regular subscribers to the podcast. This is an interview with a woman named Laura and a woman named Erin regarding their specific experiences. Part two of this will be broken up for patron members. And so if you want to enjoy part two, uh, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash strange brow radio. And there you'll find us going deeper down the rabbit hole about the expanded perspective of what happens to individuals who experience the impossible and the implications, how the worldview shifts, and um, we go down that rabbit hole pretty specifically. Also, in part two for patron members is three different interviews I tagged along, including an interview with my mother, um, an interview with my son and my stepfather, very specific interviews about three specific cases or moments or experiences they each had. Now, most of these people only want to go by their first name, so um, that's exactly what I tried to do. But I think I did spill the beans a little bit by saying uh, mom, son, stepfather. So we, uh, we double-check with them. Everything's cool on their end to air it as such. But um, if you want to hear it, you have to join Strange Brow Radio Patreon page. It's real simple to do, and uh, for as little as 3 bucks a month, you can do that. And again, that it's at patreon.com forward slash strange brow radio. Now, at the end of this show, I'll go into some details about a field trip I took because we'll be airing some footage from Northern State Hospital, the mental asylum defunct now, also called The Farm. I believe it's episode 53 with Brenda Kinzer. I rolled some film there last week, and we'll talk a little bit at the end of this episode about what exactly happened, what didn't happen, and the history of the place, because it's pretty fascinating. But for now, uh, let's go to my interview with Laura and Aaron. Okay, we're recording here, so let's okay. test your mic again. Test, test. Perfect. All right. I always wanted to be perfect. <laughs> but then I'm not Jerry Ryan. So I'm here with Laura. We're sitting out in our house, and Laura's come out to visit with us for just the night. And I've got a hot mic here. She's got one in her hot little hands. Psst. Psst. And what are you drinking over there? You have yourself I have a... something with a lot of vodka in it. <laughs> that is a vodka tonic okay. inside a retro Seattle mug that my son gave me from an uh, antique store, I'm sure in the little town of Coburg. Now, the interesting thing about the possibilities with that antique glass is that one of these antique stores that he frequented was haunted, hmm. and it was one of the places where um, something scratched him and uh, sent me a photograph. His mother was pretty concerned. I was pretty concerned. And uh, I'm not saying you're drinking out of you have a haunted cup. I'm not saying that you're drinking out of a haunted cup. I'm just saying. <laughs> My spirits your, might have spirits. Your spirits may have spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our cabin. Oh, I'm, all right. Let's party. <laughs> there we go. 
All right. Well, part of what I wanted to do here before I go out on my own adventure this evening um, is to talk to you and Aaron, who's over there uh, washing a few things, about both of... You guys are kind of like sisters, really. I mean, when I see yeah. you guys hang out, it's sister energy. You're filling each other's sentences in. Yeah, and it's Scorpio energy. Are we all three in that? Yes. When's yours? October. Same date as yours. <laughs> Is it? The 26th? <laughs> yeah. We share a birthday? Yes. Oh, I'm such an insensitive, forgetful male. You lucked out, Aaron. Oh, she gave a nice look of comfort this way. Um, anyway, so let's let's start. Um, let's talk about how you two met. And Aaron and I, we're going to be sharing a microphone. How you two met, and you go ahead and start. And Aaron, if you hear, hear anything along the way that you want to add to, you can. But if not, uh, well, she will. You go ahead and tell me how you met Aaron and oh, yeah. what, what um, started. It was on an organized uh, Bigfoot expedition. Oh, what, seven years ago? Almost eight. And uh, we didn't really hang during this expedition, but we you know, were with a large group. And uh, we kind of ended up hooking up with other folks that were interested in going out independently after that. And uh, we realized that it was really fun to hang together and explore this. So we started going out on our little expeditions of our own. Now, you're being a little coy with the expeditions and who you're going out with. Let's this for full, full exposure, are you, we talking groups? Can we not say the group? I would hesitate to say okay. the group. Okay, so we want to hold back on yeah. some of this stuff here. Okay. Yeah. Does it have an acronym? Uh, nope. Okay. All righty. Okay, so there's some things, just so the audience knows that we're going to keep cloak and dagger here, just first names and groups in particular. So... You guys go out on your first expedition. Did you say where it was? Gosh, I'm trying to think where the first one was. Oh, okay. It was um, around Mount St. Helens. Okay. And so you went out. And you now, before this time here, we're speaking specifically only about your Sasquatch adventures. Mm -hmm. What was your point of view on it? And why were you going out on an expedition? Oh, well, um, I had always kind of thought, yeah, there was a possibility that Bigfoot was real. Um, but I had an encounter um, out in the woods of Washington some years prior, and it changed my life to the point where I started thinking maybe all these other things, the paranormal things, or just things people might think are impossible are actually possible. And uh, Mm -hmm. I submitted a report to people that had experience with uh, Bigfoot encounters, and um, they basically told me I wasn't nuts. And so I said, well, I think I just need to investigate this more to try to make sense of it all, in addition to reading a ton of stuff. And so I was like, I need to meet other people that have had encounters like mine um, and try to see how it's affected their lives because it had a major impact on my life. Okay, would you mind telling us about that initial sighting? Oh, uh, sure. Um, my husband and I like to go exploring in the woods and we were out uh, hiking one day, it was in the summer, and uh, we were hunting around for some stuff in the woods and I decided I didn't want to bushwhack anymore, so. I started off on this abandoned forest road by myself, and my husband was just off in the bush. And so I'm walking, and it was a beautiful day, middle of the day, it was hot. And, you know, my husband's off somewhere towards uh, this mountain that it was near. And I hear something heavy on the road behind me. And I figure, oh, it's a cow, because in this particular area, they allow cows to roam in the woods. So I turn around and to my shock, it was not a cow. It was this, like, eight-foot-tall, cinnamon-color, hair-covered, man-like thing crossing the road and stopping at the tree line. And I'm thinking I'm having a psychotic episode, and it's just standing there, and I can't see its face, and it's, like, partially covered by the tree. I can only see the side of this head and, like, this sloping, like, not a shoulder, it just goes for like from the head down to like this arm. And then the arm is like down by the knees. And 
I'm just like, I can't be seeing this. I can't be seeing this. But I'm like, my God, it's just right there. And I was like, it's a lot thinner than I thought it might be if it's a Bigfoot. And it's like, does it actually think it's hidden? Because, like, I can see it. I can see part of it. What's it doing? And I was so shocked. I was just like, this can't be happening. It just really can't be. But there it was. And I noticed, I was like, I can see muscles rippling under the sunlight. I can see the muscle definition. The hair was like maybe two to three inches long and it was shiny. And I'm just like, my God, I'm out in the middle of nowhere here and there's this thing and it's really big and I don't know if there's more of them and I also don't know where my husband is. And so I'm complete panic. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Oh my God, it's just standing there. What's it doing? What's it doing? And I started to get really upset because I just didn't know what its intentions were, if there were more, and there's nobody. My husband's somewhere. I don't know where he is. So I'm like, okay, bear training. All right, I'm going to like leave my pack, and I'm going to start backing up. Maybe something will happen, and I start backing up, and I'm starting to take my pack off, and I'm not leaving... I'm not, you know, putting it out of my sight, and it's still there like a statue, and I'm like, what's it doing? Finally, I'm like, if I go further in, maybe there's more. So I made what I thought could have been like a decision that ended up in my life ending or something, because I'm like, I want to yell for Joe, but I don't want to tick it off. And so I thought, well, all right, I'm going to yell for Joe, and if I do and it attacks me, then all right, this is it. So I was like, Joe! And he's like, what? Where are you? And I'm like, I'm here. And he goes, what is it? And I'm like, bear. <laughs> and I can hear him come crashing through the undergrowth. And I looked and it's gone. And he appears over here and he's like, what are you calling me for a bear for? And he's like, it's just a bear. We've seen bears before. And I'm like, it just made me nervous. It just surprised me. Can we just go? And he's like, we're a long way from home, and it's the middle of Saturday, and you just want to go? And I'm like, yep. Okay. So we start back up the way where it was. Now I have no idea where it was. And we have to walk past the place where it was. And I'm having a complete heart attack the whole time. And he's like, I don't understand why you're so upset. Well, we finally get past the place. I don't see anything. And I'm like, can we please just go? And so we go. And uh, I never told him for a couple of years what had happened. But he was always puzzled about that. He never understood why I'd get upset seeing a bear. And, um, but I wasn't right for the next few months. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I was just like, life wasn't the same after I had that encounter. And finally, after a couple years, I was just, I tried to forget it. I didn't want to think about it because it had upset me so much. And um, so finally, I found out about this organization. And I'm like, well, maybe I should tell him, but I should tell him first. So I'm like, you know, honey, do you remember that time when we were out in the woods and I said I saw a bear? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, I didn't see a bear. And he's like, well, what did you see? I'm like, um, a Bigfoot? And he's like, what? You saw a Bigfoot? And I'm like, mm-hmm. Well, why didn't you tell me? And I'm like, because I thought you'd like have me committed. I mean, he's a really reasonable guy, but... I was like, I felt so insecure, mm -hmm. like saying that I saw a Bigfoot. I didn't know what he'd do. But then he was like, I want to see one. I wish you told me. And I'm like, oh. So that was like a, such a major relief. It was incredible relief. I finally decided, I said, okay, I'm going to talk to this organization. So I called. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get back with me. And it was like months. And they didn't get back with me. And I'm like, I need to talk to somebody. I really need to talk to somebody. And so I emailed them, and they're like, okay, we're going to get somebody in touch with you. And then an investigator got in touch with me. And basically, the investigator said, you know, the things that I described to him, because we'd had other um, things happen in this region, um, he said, 
there are people that are going out looking for them that don't have things like this happen. So, yeah, you're not nuts. And, yes, you know, it mm-hmm. seems like it's legitimate what you saw. And so I was. that was like incredible relief. And it led me to start just reading and reading and reading. And I, I wanted to talk to other people so much about their encounters mm-hmm. because... You know, it's like, well, if I had this this much trouble dealing with this, I bet other people had a ton of trouble dealing with it too. So that's how I got on to, you know, going on expeditions and stuff like that. Wow. You know, and after you hear someone's initial encounter, the typical question is, is how close was it? Was mm-hmm. it watching you? What did it smell mm-hmm. like? Mm-hmm. But you said some things I'm pretty interested in. You felt kind of isolated after you saw that. You mm-hmm. felt as though there was, you know, kind of a price on your conscience. It consumed you. Mm -hmm. What was it about that experience besides maybe the obvious things? They shouldn't exist. You were alone with it. Mm -hmm. Was there something else that you were dealing with, grappling with? It shook me to my very core. I mean, you know, I thought I had a pretty good grip on, okay, this is reality, you know, or my reasonable perception of what reality is. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I mean, I had a little bit of an interest in, like, the paranormal or, you know, I used to watch In Search Of, right? Okay, it was interesting. But the fact that there is a humanoid being out there that's actually not human, Mm -hmm. and it was obviously not a guy, I mean, it just blew my complete worldview away. Mm -hmm. And the magnitude of that for me, uh, I mean, I had to just rethink what, my perception of reality and life was Mm -hmm. so yeah like it was a very fundamental shift for me in my life kind of religious i mean as far as like having a religious awakening like transforming your Mm -hmm. worldview into the fact that reality as you know it has shifted from one thing that people have told you to this other Uh, world like the matrix yeah i mean uh it's not like you could go out and tell the average person on Mm -hmm. the street guess what i saw this weekend Mm -hmm. i couldn't even tell my husband and i mean we talk about everything Mm -hmm. you know um no i mean it just changed everything Mm -hmm. just changed everything because we're not describing seeing a thylacine something that existed now possibly has gone extinct Mm -hmm. and now it's yeah. back again, or it's mm-hmm. eluded us. Mm-hmm. We're talking about something so out of the ordinary and different compared to our own reality and perception that it mm-hmm. changes the way you look at everything else that isn't supposed to exist. Mm-hmm. So do you find yourself looking into those other things that shouldn't exist? <laughs> and what's your opinion about things like ghosts and UFOs now? Um, I'm a lot more Mm open-minded to other things that have been historically perceived as legend Mm -hmm. or fairy tales or myths. Yes, I find myself to be much more open to uh, other arenas, (laughs) you know, and to not so quickly discount others' accounts of abnormal, strange Mm -hmm. things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I want to ask, was it looking at you? How, how close was it? Okay, so... <laughs> no, it, now it, you were alone with it, so mm-hmm. it, it's it's how, how many feet away from you? Let's get into that. I, I could go yards. Mm-hmm. Uh, I described the range to mm-hmm. the investigator, you know, and they indicated it was probably about 30 yards, mm-hmm. 30, 35 yards. Um, yeah, and I we didn't have eye contact. I mean, mm-hmm. it is a distance, you know, I just saw it in profile as it crossed the forest road, and mm-hmm. then the face was blocked, you know, by a tree when it was turned facing me. But, yeah, so I never had, like, an eye lock or anything. I probably would have expired if I had <laughs> seriously made eye contact with mm-hmm. it. Be- oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I just don't know what Yeah, I yeah. I mean, that. you were visually shaken. I, I mean, I've got goosebumps that. on goosebumps right now just talking about it. Just thinking about, about it. It. Uh, it was an unearthly account- encounter. I mean, seriously, like. Mm-hmm. You, you, God, yeah. There's just nothing else like it. Why didn't it look at you? I mean, 35 yards is very I close. Know. I don't know. I mean, it was just busy crossing the mm-hmm. forest road. Mm-hmm. It was on a mission. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It just stopped mm-hmm. at those trees. 
I, I mean, what is it doing if it if it's not looking at me, but it stopped behind a tree, but it's not even like totally covered? Mm-hmm. What is that? I mean, it obviously, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't hidden. I don't know. I don't know what that behavior, I don't know. Hmm. It just doesn't make sense to me. Now, you put yourself back in the wilderness to continue to try to have these experiences. So it wasn't mm-hmm. necessarily a bad thing. Well, you know, I mean, it changed my life. It traumatized me. But, you know, after I shared my story with other people, you know, the investigator and other people who had encounters, it made me, it gave me such a great sense of relief that I was like, I have got to know what this is. Mm -hmm. I have got to know what this is. I read so many books. I read like 30 books because I was like, I need to know. I need to know. And in I'm normally a fairly curious person, Mm -hmm. but this awakened an incredible thirst to know Mm -hmm. everything I could know about this. And other people's encounters would provide me all additional information to help me put Mm -hmm. some kind of a picture together Mm -hmm. to explain what had happened. And so, yeah, I, you know, I admit like the first expedition or two that I went out on, I was white with fear. (laughs) I mean, terrified. But at the same time, I'm like, I have got to know. I have got to know. And that just drove me. I still have to know. You know? Um, yeah. Have you had that second encounter? Oh, yeah. 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 You've had <laughs> I that mean, second, third, fourth? How many? Uh, oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, I have like a second solid mm-hmm. sighting. But, I mean, I've got other like nighttime partial. Mm-hmm. I don't even really know. Like, I've heard them at really close range. I've seen like in profile at night. I've seen eye glow at night. I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like 10 times maybe. Full. Okay. But not full. full, on, full on no, two, no. I mean, two. you've had full yeah, I have two yeah. full, like and I can these see other their body. Ancillary experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's get into those soon. But mm-hmm. how far after your initial encounter was the with the one? bear, quote unquote, did Tough. you meet Aaron? Oh, let's see. Well, we met the summer after mm. I reported to the organization. Okay. In the at the expedition, and then we started going out mm-hmm. together with a group of other people that summer. Okay. Yeah, it was like 2012. Okay. Yeah. 2012. That was a mm-hmm. unique year in Bigfoot world, just in general. Uh-huh. Okay. Now let's move over here to the party on my left. The way we'll do this, I'm going to hand you this microphone. I'm going to take this, and then I will go ahead and interview her for a minute. So go ahead and hold this young woman. So we're here with Aaron and you met Laura out in near, you said Mount St. Helens and you, but you're a childhood experiencer as well. You've been dealing with this phenomena for a long time and, and other things, but let's just stick mainly with the property at hand now not only the property that we're at but other properties you've been dealing with experiences off and on your whole life right uh no not my not really i mean when i was 10 i had my first sighting and then i kind of put that to rest okay. for years and then um had an epiphany that oh it wasn't a bear it was a bigfoot but that was gosh i don't know um like over 30 years later, that's how old I am. Right. So 10 years is, I mean, 10 years old is pretty young. And you thought you had an encounter with something different. I, there was a childhood memory that you had of seeing something in particular that we have hanging on the wall that you kind of thought was indicative of a Bigfoot, right? I mean, you were trying to put the pieces together, but you thought it was something else. Right. So when I was 10, um, I was up with my folks way up in the middle of nowhere above Lake Chelan. So we're talking like 1978 or 79. And um, there was five kids on this retreat. This place was, you know, remote. So you're talking, uh, you have to get on a ferry and uh, you've got to go nearly all the length of Lake Chelan, which is, I think it's like 17 miles long or I don't know. And then you have to get off in the middle of nowhere and get on this big old school bus and drive 17 miles up a mountain and it dead ends on a dirt road at an old um, mining 
town, like a silver and copper mine. And uh, there was, uh, they turned this little town into, um, I think it was a Lutheran retreat. So there was only five kids in this retreat, and it was late summer, and um, we'd stay for the weekend. So that year I noticed, because we'd go every year since I was a little tiny kid, that year there were no chipmunks, and I always look forward to feeding the chipmunks out of my hand. They were so tame every year. And that year there were no chipmunks, and I was really bummed, and I couldn't figure out, there was no wildlife. I was like, gosh, that's odd. And uh, on the last night, on Saturday night, uh, we all had a great big picnic dinner, and, uh, you know, it was sundown, and, and so the kids thought, hey, let's have a, a game of hide-and-go-seek, right? And there were four girls and one, one boy, and the boy was the oldest, and uh, I remember his name was Jimmy, and he was such a brat, and uh, he always found everybody, right? He was like the best seeker of the hide-and-seeks, and I thought, I'm not going to let Jimmy win this game, so <laughs> I'm going to go a little further out to hide, you know? not just in a bush nearby or behind a picnic table. I'm going to go back behind the cabins that aren't being used on this particular street. <laughs> so I went way out of where the, the circle of light was, you know, the, f the fire or the lanterns. And um, I, as he's counting, I'm running, and I whip behind this unused building, and cabin, and... Uh, my eyes hadn't adjusted to the dark yet, so I whipped behind the building and I hear kind of like a gravel moving on hard pan. And I thought, oh, dang it. One of the other kids is, you, you know, decided to use this hiding spot too and came around the other side of the building, so I stopped. I kind of held my breath and I was letting my eyes adjust and I realized that the wood pile that I was going to hide behind, behind this unused cabin, was standing up. And <laughs> so I watched as my eyes were adjusting this huge wood pile start to stand up very slowly with no sound whatsoever. And as my eyes were adjusting, I could see a complete silhouette of the wood pile because the light that was coming from the gathering spot that everyone was at was shining past the back of this building that was probably, I don't know, it couldn't have been more than 20 foot long building. It might have even been smaller. And so I watched this wood pile keep standing up and standing up and it was going to hit the top of its head on the overhang on the back of the building and I think standard building overhangs are like what seven and a half feet tall and it had to to keep from hitting its head on this overhang it had to maneuver around to keep standing up so it was over seven and a half feet tall and it, it didn't move right um, it was completely silent it moved kind of liquidy, like a ninja, so I, like a liquid ninja. <laughs> and then it kind of stood out, like, hey, hey, how you doing? You were going to run into me. I thought I would stand up so you wouldn't literally run into me or hide behind me. And I went, okay, I, 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 I know this, is, this has got to be a bear, right? <laughs> So I didn't scream, and I knew I wasn't supposed to run, but I did. <laughs> I literally just did what I wasn't supposed to do and turned around and ran back towards the light and about knocked bratty Jimmy over, screaming for my dad, there's a bear, there's a man, there's a man bear. But, you know, everybody freaked out, and of course, guys got, I don't know, a baseball bat or whatever they had, thinking there's a bear behind the building, and there was nothing there. Uh, there was no crashing through the bushes. There was no footprints to be had the next day because we looked because my dad's like, oh, you, mm -hmm. you saw a big bear and it stood up on its hind legs, you know. I thought, damn, I've never seen a bear in the wild, but I didn't think they were that big. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, that's really, bears are really scary and they're really tall. And this had to have been like polar bear size. But the weird thing was is it was a really lanky bear, like, and of course, what Star Wars had come out around that time, and the first thing that came to my mind was Chewbacca because it was so hairy and it was so lanky. And I literally, I couldn't, it was very, it had to have had black or very dark fur all over it, no neck, and it looked like somebody in a hoodie, a furry hoodie. And um, so I didn't see any eyes, I didn't smell anything, I didn't hear anything except for that initial, you know, scraping of gravel on hard pan, and that's what made me stop. So I think it did it on purpose. Um, and um, 
I did. I definitely saw the full silhouette of it. I don't really remember a whole lot about the length of the legs because I kept watching the shoulders and the head just, you know, come up and up and up. I definitely remember the shoulders and the arms. I don't remember the legs and feet a whole lot. And um, it had longer hair, but it was it was long and lanky, like like a Chewbacca. Like, man, we've got some really effed up bears in the forest of Washington State. Didn't even occur to me because you know we don't have. Bigfoots and Yetis, and I was into all those things, but it didn't even cross my mind that it could have been something like that. I was told it was a bear, and my dad later told me, years later, that he suspected that that's what it could have been, but he didn't want to scare me because we lived in the woods, and we went hiking, and we went camping, and I rode horses in the woods by myself, and he didn't want me to be freaked out. And so I wasn't, but I was traumatized enough to have... um, PTSD in a, a way that I would have reoccurring nightmares about bears all the time coming around corners and there was bears like a lot of bears or one bear and I always had a, <laughs> I was a big healthy fear of bears and I didn't even think that that's what it was it didn't even cross my mind or occur to me till years later I went up to Port Angeles and they have this uh, drive through wildlife place what is that place called um no, not Northwest Track. It's up by Port Angeles. Uh, Squim. Olympic Game Farm. And I took my son and my stepson to go to see the bears. And they have, you know, grizzly bears up there, along with various other huge animals. And we're watching them play around, and the boys are enjoying it. And I'm looking, and this one bear stands up to play with a tire or something they had in this particular enclosure. And I thought, God, you know, it reminds me of that time I whipped around a corner and saw a Chewbacca bear. <laughs> but I'm going, God, that is not nearly as big as what I saw. And supposedly this was a really big grizzly bear that they had had retired there from the movies or something. So we get done looking at the bears, and I go over to talk to this gal that's working over in that uh, area. And I said, hey, ma'am. And I start saying, do these, do these bears ever get any bigger? And she's looking at me. She goes, well, that's a I mean, pretty darn big bear. I mean, maybe polar bears, right? She goes, why? So I told her the story I just told you, and she is listening and going, yeah. Hey, um, ma'am, did you ever think that maybe you saw a Bigfoot? And that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh, my God. So, of course, immediately I called my dad, and I said, hey, you know that time? And he goes, yeah, I thought that maybe, he goes, I've milled that over in my head many times. He goes, I think that that's what it was. (laughs) So then um, I started to kind of think about all the other things that had happened to me when I moved back into the area 25 years ago and all the weird stuff that happened at my horse farm while I was living by myself out in the woods. And uh, things started (laughs) clicking into place. So I got really into investigating Sasquatches, and uh, that's how Laura and I met. I finally got on, uh, I had to sign up for an expedition, and I finally was accepted, and that's how we met. Okay, so you said a lot there. Let me, I want to rewind, because I thought for sure that what you said that you saw reminded you of a buffalo, but it didn't. It reminded you of a, of a bear. It reminded me of a bear, but what was triggered me with this buffalo head that is in the living room right. was the size of the head yeah. and the fur. Okay. It's dark. You can't re- Like, I never saw features. It literally was all silhouette. Mm-hmm. But that, yeah, the buffalo head triggers me because of the length of the hair, the size of the head, right. and the color. Okay. The other thing you said, too, which is really cool, I'd never heard you describe the fact, well, I knew you said it didn't move right. It moved like it was basically boneless and mm-hmm. moved like jelly. Mm-hmm. It was a liquid ninja. Ninja comes up again over and over. But then when you said that it scraped the gravel on the hard pan on purpose. I think it did. When did you come to that realization? Because that takes it totally out of a wild animal. Right, because... When it got up to me, I think it was laying on its belly watching us kids play hide and seek in the dark. Just probably being entertained. It could have been there the whole weekend. I don't know. But I think from the position that I saw it in, thinking it was a big pile of wood, 
it was either crouched down for sure it had to have been crouched down at the very least i, I think it was laying on its belly mm -hmm. and i think what happened was it knew i was coming around and made the noise so i would not run into it or hide behind it because the when it got up to move slowly not aggressively right it could have reached right out and got me i was literally about 12 foot from this it got up and moved so gracefully so you know like liquid it was so si not even a you know hey, your bones creak you know when you get up from a weird position do i <laughs> i know Jesus. i do <laughs> It didn't make any My any bones sound. fart, actually. Do they? Yeah. You have farting bones. I have farting wow. bones. Wow, I, I never knew. <laughs> I, I'm just yeah. so impressed. You don't now. know? Okay. Well, maybe you I kind of do. Yeah. I just don't call them farting bones. <laughs> farting but, bones. Right. <laughs> this okay. did not have farting bones. And I'm like, well, how so do you So as it no rose up, you said the flange at the top of the roof was about seven and a half feet. It avoided that and had to reposition its body in a way. It had to move like an S, and that's what made it move like liquid. Oh. It literally, it didn't even look up. I mean, mm -hmm. it literally was getting up, and it had to maneuver itself in a really weird way. Right. And that's what made it look more liquidy. It mm -hmm. did not move. It was so smooth, like a ninja. Right. And silent, dead silent. And I thought, if it can do this, and while I'm running away like a freak... <laughs> And make no sound. Like, I didn't hear running, stomping. This had to have been something massive and surely weighed a lot, would have made a lot of noise. Right. It just made no noise. It, 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 not a breath. Not a, not a bone fart. Not a bone fart. As you fart. call it. Not a, <laughs> <laughs> not, not a sound. Um, not a piece of gravel move. So I thought, I thought about it a long, long time. And over the, you know, after I had this epiphany, right, mm -hmm. with the, the grizzly bears, I thought, surely it had to have made a noise on purpose, but a noise that wasn't going to terrify me. Like it could have grunted like a mm. bear. It could have stomped. It could have gone or yelled, anything like that. It didn't. It just went kind of that, kind of like you skid out on hard pan, just yeah. this little hard pan gravel scrape. It was such an innocent little sound. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it wasn't aggressive and it moved slow, so I didn't freak out. It didn't come towards me. It didn't have a st stance that was aggressive. Mm -hmm. So I think it did it on purpose. So I'd stop. And your dad, he's saying, well, I kind of thought that all along, maybe it was. Was he experienced in this at all at that no, time? No, no. Mm -mm. But no. he becomes interested in this to the point where he writes a book. Yeah, he did after um, I called him that day and I said, hey, remember that time? And he he got interested in, in it again because I got really interested in it and uh, started to question him more. And and then pretty soon he was going out on expeditions with Laura and I. And yeah, he wrote a book about it. And what's the name of the book? Uh, I'm Bigfoot, <laughs> Believe It or Not. Oh, yeah, Bigfoot, Believe It or Not. By? Don Edgars. Okay. And people can find that on Amazon if they want to. They so you guys end up and immediately click at one of these campouts underneath Mount St. Helens. You both kind of have similar stories. They're brief encounters that change your lives. And then you guys kind of come become obsessed with the phenomena. That word gets thrown around once in a while. So here's two women, which alone, right, without your spouses involved with the subject matter. It's not like right. at the time you have a spouse going to expeditions or you have a, a spouse going with you on expeditions. Well, sometimes the okay, availability so, element is right. Know, <laughs> not but was there available. an interest? You're saying yeah, there initially was there was interest. Mm -hmm. But yeah. not a lot of availability to go together. Okay. So you had more avail flexibility mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. Okay. So 2012... Now we're here at 2020. You've had eight years, nine years to ponder on this issue. Um, so many things to ask you guys about the stories that I've heard. In particular, um, well, there's one area in particular that we spoke about earlier where it's a hotbed full of activity. But I think most of us feel like these hotbeds are all over. You probably are in a hotbed right now. And... Um, do you make a transition, Laura, from looking at this as a cryptid to something else? Where are you at as far as your perspective on what Bigfoot is? Oh, well, um, I think I agree with what the mainland North America um, 
indigenous peoples synopsis is, which is, you know, they're another people. And I base that off of some encounters I've had where I have encountered their language um, and some gifting exchange behaviors, uh, which, you know, I've heard conversations that several of them have had with each other, which I'm like, well, okay, if mm. they've got a language, they're more than just a wood ape. Um, I've heard it distinctly. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I, they're, a, they're a type of people. I mean, some of the tribes in the Northwest have old stories about them coming to powwow some of the uh, trading at powwow etc some of the tribes in the eastern part of, of mm -hmm. washington for example so I, I totally agree they are people and so that transition from your initial sighting before 2011 to coming to terms that they're a type of people is that a quick transition is that a you know it was not quick no it was no. a slow mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and there's still more to it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's still more to learn oh, uh, for yes. all of us uh, regarding mm -hmm. this issue. But now you have these added experiences. I mean, you've been with Aaron when, well, I don't know, were you with Aaron? And I'll have you guys speak here. I'm going to give the mic to her now and have mm -hmm. you guys too just kind of catch up and maybe relate stories about this area that we're going to call, um, we'll just call it Area E. That's what we'll call it. And um, in Area E, is this where you experienced a UFO that zapped you? Were you there that night the when that happened? The spotlight, Spot yes. Okay. Sure, we'll call it Area, Area H. Area H, okay. Area H. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit. I'm going to hand the mic over here. Let sure. unfold that experience here because this is miles away from Bigfoot talk as far as other people are concerned. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And maybe you guys can explain why or what your opinion is on it. So start from the beginning with the area and the experience where the spotlight happened. Okay, so years later, after the my first Bigfoot sighting and in several after yours, we started going out closer to home instead of having to go out with these uh, big groups for expeditions. And uh, we've been told by some insiders from other groups up here in the Pacific Northwest, some hot places to go. One of them being um, this an area? indigenous person mm -hmm. and that told us and they gave us directions to this area. So Laura and I would go scope out some, some places because we love to go camping anyways. And so uh, her and I, my father, my, my son and my father started doing this by the way, uh, with me, which was cool. Um, and then one other friend of ours named Dave, we decided, hey, let's go up for a quick weekend. And it was July and the end of July, and it was a burn ban. And this was in 2013. Things got really freaky for, I think, for everybody. <laughs> General in the paranormal field, really. 2013 was quite the year. Oh, yeah. So um, we uh, went up to cold camp, and my dad uh, bedded down. It was probably like close to 11 o'clock at night. And there was a full moon that was going to rise, but it, it hadn't risen yet. And we were watching out for like uh, early meteor showers, right? The Perseids weren't there yet, but sometimes you could get a really great yep. uh, meteor and or two at that time of year. No fire. N yeah, it was a cold camping. No, light. no fire, no light. And we're all sitting around the fire pit, but with nothing but an LED candle <laughs> for a flicker effect. My dad went to bed and he was facing west and I was facing west and our friend Dave was straight across from me looking at me facing east and Laura was to the left of me facing north and uh, I'm we're all talking and telling our paranormal tales and I'm looking through the tops of some of the trees and I could see a mountain behind us and uh, there's a big clear spot to the sky and I'm looking for meteors and all of a sudden I'm looking at the sky and this huge, like an aperture opens up in the sky. It looked like one of those Hollywood spotlights. It just opened up big, bright, white. It looks bigger than the full moon, which would have been rising in the east behind me, but it, it wasn't even up yet. And it happened really quick and I'm looking at it and it literally opened up, blinded me and Dave, who was sitting across from me, saw just my face light up bright white. Laura, who was looking north, it actually spotlighted her in her left eye, 
and gave glare. My dad, who had gone to bed and was sleeping in the tent, was faced towards it. It lit up through the tent, through his eyeballs. And our friend Dave stood up and goes, holy bleep, thinking that the tent had blown up behind him because it was so bright. And it closed silently, didn't move. Um, we were in a Bigfoot hot spot. We didn't have a whole lot of action, but um, except for iGlow. I, I don't know what to make of that. And then, then of course, we're all laughing, going, oh, are we missing any yeah, time? Yeah, look at your oh, watch, dude. Right. Are you missing time? <laughs> but I mean, uh, yeah, we're, it's a completely dark forest. And it was like deciduous, okay? We didn't have a lot of trees really close to us. It was the, you know, rough campsite area. And, I mean, it was dark. Mm-hmm. Dark. And silent. To have, the, to have this white, hot spotlight just hit Aaron, just bonk, no noise. And then like a couple seconds later, we're like, what the bleepity bleeping bleep was that? I mean. And it was far away. Yeah. It was because I saw that it wasn't on the mountain or on a tree. It was behind the mountain from very, very far. And Dave said it literally only lit up my face like a round spotlight. It was so incredibly bright. It was just. Shocking. I was blinded. Yeah. No noise. No plane noise. No car noise. No other people noise. No trailing. Nothing. Tail. The no. meteor, comet. There was no uh, reason for it. Uh, we had no evidence of other campers nearby previously that evening. Mm-mm. Nothing. Um, it literally opened up in the sky. Of course, when we told my mother when we got back down the mountain the next day, she goes, oh, that government, it just, does, don't they do weird things? <laughs> well, let's okay, go Mom. out and party. <laughs> right. the, shock these campers. <laughs> we need oh, better dear. stuff to do. Right. No. People are going, it's uridium flares. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now, did anything happen past that evening with you guys? Did you experience anything before or after that that kind of gave you more answers to that? Not before, nothing before. Just the and eye glow. After. Yeah. That, but that was, that even the same night? I don't even I know if that was, was the, the same night. night. I think I it think was. was I think it was the Is next that our night. fireside conversation with our two other companions, the other side of the berm? Was it that night? Yeah. Yeah. Now what does that mean? Oh, my. Well, so that was a trip when there were more people that came later, I think, because they went out for a night walk, I believe. Oh, that was a different trip then. Okay. That was an oh, entirely yeah, yeah, different okay. trip. It was just us four different, on that one, on the trip, spotlight same trip. Location. Nobody but. wanted to go with us after the spotlight <laughs> trip. They're like, yeah. it was it was location <laughs> age. Get abducted. Different different trip, but yeah, Aaron, Aaron and I had stayed back at camp. Let's talk about that one. Yeah, the rest of the group had gone out on a night walk. They were quite some distance away. Well, you, you were with her, so you hold it. <laughs> and uh, okay. oh. Aaron and I were enjoying, you know, time around the fire hanging out because uh, and at this point I had gotten past the sheer terror of having, you know, having an encounter thinking that, Hey, let's see if uh, we get any action, you know, some visitors with two of us sitting around the fire with the rest of the group going down the road. And so we're sitting there talking just about whatever fire is going. And suddenly we hear what sounds like two very large, very old Japanese guy having a low conversation. And the timber of the voices was so low, so deep, there is no human that could possibly replicate it. It is simply impossible. Close. Yes, it was, they what, 10 feet, maybe 15? Um, I want to say the voices were probably 20. They were just out of the firelight yeah, area. They were past this little berm and so, bush area. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but they were close. Oh yeah, and and they're just having this <laughs> right, <laughs> like belching like, and talking. We heard, yeah, no, we <laughs> like heard two of them words. I mean, it was a conversation. You know how if you're in another room, right, you can hear somebody having it, but we could hear distinctly the words. Mm-hmm. Huge voice timber, deep timber. You know, and we're like, uh, and Aaron's like, Laura, are you hearing that? Keep talking, and I'm like. Uh huh, <laughs> and we realized that, yep, we have two very large friends, probably not that far from us, mm-hmm. hiding in the undergrowth near us, discussing us, probably. 
They're, they're probably not sitting there talking about the weather. They're talking about these two chicks in the middle of the night mm-hmm. sitting alone by a fire out in the middle of the woods. Mm-hmm. And what are they doing? Yeah. Maybe divvying up which one they're going to carry away. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Now, what did you do? We just kind of kept talking mm-hmm. while trying to also simultaneously <laughs> listen to, I mean, not like we could understand anything they were saying, mm-hmm. but it's like, holy crap, yes, this is happening. Yep. <laughs> so no wall of fear, no... Uh, I mean, you know, I the, the hair on my arms mm-hmm. is standing up because you realize, mm-hmm, we're not alone, and yes, it's likely them. Yeah, it's them. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And when you realize you're in the proximity of something that is extraordinarily large Mm -hmm. and it's not a human, okay, yeah. And there are two. two. You know, I'm not like terrified that they're going to hurt us or anything like that, but it's like, ooh, the little paranormal hackles raise up, you know, and they, Mm -hmm. wow, this is freaky cool. You know, it's, 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 it's freaky, but it's also seriously cool. So, yeah, that was interesting. Okay. I think we radioed the guys that Mm -hmm. had gone up Mm -hmm. further up. They were like a half a mile away Mm -hmm. just to make sure it wasn't them Mm -hmm. and to ask if maybe they could start heading back our direction. And we made that fire really high. And your son had heard some of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. My son was kind of freaked out. And so he had gone into the tent Mm -hmm. to get in the sleeping bag and put his headphones on and listen to music on high. So he didn't have to, you know, kind of... How you put your uh, your fingers in your ears and go la la, <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I remember going, well, we better be a little quiet about this because my son's probably going to get a mm-hmm. little panicked. And oh, um, we didn't. I don't know it. if that was the time when we also. Heard, it was just out of like the range of. Mm-hmm. We made the fire really big because this was before mm-hmm. the spotlight. It was probably in May or something. Yeah. It wasn't a burn ban at the time. But it was always just right outside of the firelight mm-hmm. area. So we made the fire really big. <laughs> so we had a larger area. And I don't know if that was the time when we heard the steps running up and pounding the ground. I mean, running towards us. And it would stop just before it got to where the firelight started. That may have been. Yeah, it might yeah. have been that time. Yeah, it was My very, son was there and I remember him getting a little freaked out. It was very interesting because there was someone, something running up the trail to come in the main path to yeah, come in we could, yeah, where the could, guys were going to come from plainly. and come in and i mean it was not that far away no um it couldn't have been more than 30 feet and it no. would just stop yeah almost like playing chicken a little right and no chance i'm just going with playing devil's mm-hmm. advocate that you were hoaxed by anybody else from the group that was out and about Well, if they had super impressive sound equipment, Mm -hmm. right? you know, if they had brought all that equipment with them and Mm -hmm. decided to plop it in the bushes, right? you know, at random, knowing that we were going to be sitting, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you had the sound of the fire crackling. You had, uh, you know, you already had a sound going. So for something Mm -hmm. to be heard that's whispering on the outside of that fire is... No, it's, it wasn't whispering. It was just low. Okay, but low and but high enough to where it was over the sound of the fire. Yeah, which was yeah. your main source of what you would be hearing. Mm. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it was just. It sounded like you know, say you had you know we're sitting at an outdoor cafe and two old guys are talking about a chess game. I mean right. that's only it was much bigger and deeper. You know. Right. Yeah. And no eye shine. No, you did see. We did. So over, <laughs> Laura, Laura was sitting facing me and I'm facing her and we're making this fire big. Now this fire was big and bright because we were c- pretty freaked out. And um, behind Laura, <laughs> thank God you didn't see it. And I'm like, now Laura, I don't want you to panic, <laughs> but <laughs> two big old eyes <laughs> were behind her. <laughs> Pro, you know, probably it's a good thing just, I didn't see it. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> just again out of the firelight. So they had to have been 20 foot behind you. And uh, we, we did go the next day to see exactly where they would have been and what the train was like back there because they popped up behind an old, dead, tall stump. And uh, the now, mind you, the fire was so bright. How I saw these two eyes through the blaze of this fire is pretty dumbfounding to me. 
I said, okay, I don't want you to panic, but I'm pretty sure we just had eye glow behind you. It's back there. Don't freak out. But they were a really weird color. They were really big, like, you know, good golf ball size, and they were far apart. And they just opened and they closed. That's all mm -hmm. I got, but they were bright enough and stayed on long enough to where I clearly saw them over and above the, the glare of this giant fire. Were those the ones that you said were kind of like a dirty yellow? Yeah, they were like a dirty yellowy mm -hmm. orange, mm -hmm. like an ambery mm -hmm. color. No yeah. sound. But um, I've only seen eye glow twice, and that was one of the times. <laughs> and the and other Laura time. got closer to the fire <laughs> and then moved over by me. <laughs> and then, yeah, the first time I saw eye glow was with Aaron yeah. at another location. We'll call that location mm -hmm. B. Yeah. And... Uh, Oh, it was actually beautiful. It was shocking, <laughs> but it was really beautiful. We were mm. on another larger expedition mm. doing a night walk, so no lights on a forest road. Mm -hmm. And um, we uh, were just looking ahead, you know, trying to not trip and kill yourself on the dark forest road, but just walking along with a, a mm -hmm. relatively small group. It was just you, me, and one other girl. Oh, really? Okay, I thought there were a couple others. But anyway, we so... Meeting up with people. Oh, okay. So we're looking straight ahead, and suddenly I saw these two, like golf ball size, light green, beautiful shade of green, like light jade orbs. I saw these two, and I'm like, whoa! And then there was like two others lower. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, did you see that? And Erin's like, yes, I did. What color was it? Smart girl. And I said green, and she said yes. And then we realized in the morning, that area where we'd been walking, well, if whoever owned those eyes was standing in the ditch, because that's where the location was, where we actually saw them, they would have been about 10 feet tall. Yeah, they would have had to have been in either yes. in trees. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, really you know. I only saw three, though, because one my angle, mm -hmm. I think one was partially one side. peaking. Yeah. Yes, enter depends, right? In the morning when we right. realize, like, oh holy crap, God. those eyes were about 10 feet off the ground. Oh my gosh. And it was not only a new moon that night, but it was also overcast. There wasn't oh, even yes. any starlight. Not a hint of anything. No it was light. pitch black. And yeah. we were using kind of the sky to gauge mm -hmm. where the road was going. Mm -hmm. Look at the tops of the trees. I'm going to need to let you take the next brief segment for a nature break. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, those are all good stories. We'll have Laura come back here, but why I've got you, Aaron. Um, okay, so you go to both of these areas, um, well, both of these locations with Laura. Did you ever go there uh, without her? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I went on, um, yeah, she's been on a couple without me, and I've been on a couple without her mm -hmm. in both of the locations, actually. The dogs are barking out here. I'm just mm -hmm. checking it out. Okay. They're just doing their rounds. Doing their rounds, barking at the trees. Okay. I guess I should let people know that we're we're at the Al Moon altar. And if you know anything about the story of uh, my own experiences, they were down mainly in Oregon. But now we're up in Washington. I moved up here in May 2008. And let's just give people a little perspective on how you and I met. You and I met uh, at a conference, and it was a Sasquatch conference, and I had a table there, you were attending that, and um, you and I immediately started to communicate off and on, periodically, online, and just kind of keep tabs with one another, but you had said that you grew up on or near, we'll say, Maury Island, Fox Island area. I'm totally unfamiliar with the Pacific uh, Northwest outside of Oregon, especially the Olympic Peninsula. But when you said, I live up in the Olympic Peninsula, I'm like, oh my God, you know, here's a gal that does expeditions. She's having activity all the time since she's 10 years old. But we're in the location where you've had ongoing stuff happen, including having mushrooms thrown at you, seeing the uh, horse's mane braided. Um, I don't really know, though. Have you had an actual sighting here? All right, and to get the answer to that question, you'll have to subscribe. Part two is waiting for you at patreon.com 
forward slash strange brown. Also, the interview I did with my son, uh, my mother, and my stepfather, all very unique encounters, experiences. Uh, you will be surprised, uh, very surprised by one of them in particular, a pretty incredible encounter from my stepdad, who's never gone on the record about what happened to him, so that was a pretty unique moment. And as for a guy who's kind of laid himself out, fully exposed to family members, you can imagine the, uh, the type of comments that probably have come my way about uh, my unique hobbies. Well, it looks like they got egg all over their face, and so I was happy to expose them, even if it was only on a first-name basis. So that's under part two at patreon.com forward slash strange brow radio. I think that's for as little as three bucks a month you can get a hold of that interview. Also, if you want to uh, see the video, there's another tier, and you can join that level. And there you will be privy to some videos, including the one we just shot from Northern State Hospital. Now let's talk a little minute about that. If you go back to episode 53 with Brenda Kenzer, the episode called The Farm, you'll learn about exactly where I went. In the town of Cedra Woolley, for a period of almost... Well, 80, 70 years or greater was the Northern State Mental Hospital for the Criminally Insane, a self-sustained uh, hospital that included a large-scale farm. Both of these buildings um, are incredibly haunted. Now, I went there with a rolling camera with Brenda as my tour guide. She explained the types of encounters that her and several other people have had while... Uh, roaming in particular the farm which is an a, a totally accessible area that you can go to day or night they don't suggest you stay there at night uh, maybe one of the reasons is what happens when the sun goes down now I thought it was going to be an uneventful event we rolled film got some brilliant photos then Brenda explained to me a specific spot near the farm where her and a group of people saw a large shadowy figure cover the threshold of the door into one of the large enclosures where probably the cattle was at one time and in that enclosure I found a nail next to a rope which I think was to be some kind of pendulum some kind of spirit communication tool you research pendulums you can find out for yourself what they use them for this is where this large shadow was seen by Brenda and some friends, and it wasn't a good experience. Well, I found a nail, and I put the nail in my pocket as a memento, and there it sat. I went back to my hotel room, hung my jacket up, and forgot about the nail, really, until, well, about, I guess it would have been about 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock uh, the next day. As soon as I put my coat on, I got extremely sick. Now, there was the likelihood that I could have caught something, the stomach flu, whatever. Um, it felt different than that. So, I started to put two and two together uh, around two o'clock in the afternoon after the stomach stuff would not subside. Mind you, this was on Valentine's Day. I know, a lovely gesture on my end. And so, I dug around my pocket and found the nail that I'd taken from the farm. And I left it uh, on a old building in the town of Coopville, Washington. And there it sat. But before I left, I took a photograph of it and posted a story on our Facebook page about what I suspected was a haunted object and how you probably shouldn't poke the bear. And I felt immediately good after I left the object there but I started to get sick again and um, it came on just the same way as before to the point where I couldn't eat and I thought well now I know I have the stomach flu but last night I got a phone call out of the blue actually we got a phone call and a message delivered to me from a friend that let's just say is very gifted in these ways and said that she felt led to tell somebody at our house either me or Aaron, that we shouldn't have photographs up of haunted objects. Now, this person had no idea that I a, had a possibly haunted nail, uh, let alone put a post up about it that uh, she's not a member of. 
And that's how random this was. A phone call came in to tell me, basically, that until this photograph was taken down, which has been deleted, um, well, it was, uh, it was confirmation. So I, I went ahead and deleted that. So if you saw the post and you know a little bit about it and um, the story related to it, but I guess I wanted to say as a warning, don't poke the bear. If you see something that uh, looks like it might be worth a dark creep a memento from a haunted place, best leave it there. And photographs. Um, I, I guess don't take photographs of them even. They still have a, an attachment of some kind. So feeling much better now. Can't even really think about that nail at this point. <laughs> I was nailed by a nail. All right, so there's my crazy story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, again, if you want to hear part two of the encounter with uh, Laura and Aaron and some family members, join patreon.com forward slash strange brow radio, and there you'll find an availability to do it. If you have an encounter that you want to discuss or shoot me an email, you can do that at strangebrowradio at gmail.com. All right, thanks again for listening. And, of course, I will see you in the trees. Thank you.